Uh, so we're, uh, we have a really fun panel now for the second, the second session before the break. So we're going to invite all the speakers up, and I'll, I'll introduce them as, as they come up. So we'll start with, uh, with Jeff Cares. Uh, Jeff, I, um, full disclosure, I've had, a, I've had a professional relationship with Jeff Cares for, for many years now. He's, he's a dear friend. Uh, uh, and I think we, we uh, sort of um, hatched the whole concept of Mineral X over, over drinks a few a few different times. He's one of the world's uh, leading spatial and geostatisticians um, uh, and uh, a, real, a real visionary. Uh, I want to invite up Amar Singh. Uh, Amar is the president uh, of Vidra, uh, uh, venture, venture capital fund uh, uh, funded mostly by Morocco in collaborations with the Moroccan state, investing in um, investing uh, in the materials of the future uh, and uh, innovation, uh, innovation in ways in ways that leverage leverage uh, their sovereign uh, their sovereign advantages. I want to invite Megan Croker. Crocker, there she is, Megan Crocker. Megan uh, Megan is the director of uh, of partnerships for CSIRO IRO. Uh, that is uh, Australia's. Australia's preeminent scientific uh, funding uh, agency, uh, and she's here in in the Bay Area, I think, making making connections between U.S. science and Australian science. Uh, and David and David Zen, senior researcher here at at Stanford, um, who's been here for several years now, works with Jeff Cares. And as you will have seen on the, my previous talk, one of the inventors of, of that stochastic inversion technology. OK. Um, That's it. You're first? That's it, yeah. Yeah, OK. Go, thanks, go, go Jeff. All right. Uh, thanks, Kurt. And uh, thanks again, everyone, uh, for attending. So David and I, we started Mineral X in December from nothing. And here you are. Amazing. Uh, first, of course, I'd like to acknowledge um, that the event is taking place on ancestral lands of the Mwakma Olomi tribe, and we are very grateful for their opportunity to host us here. Mineral X celebrates that culture and the perseverance of the Olomi people and their strong identity. So I'd like to start uh, out with really the vision and the mission of what Mineral X is. And, um, just as we saw in the, in the previous presentation, um, the energy transition is really about lots of things. One of this is about the ingredients. What ingredients do we need, right? We need wind, we need solar, we need Earth's heat, and we need Earth's materials. And so Earth materials is one of those things that is most uncertain in, in that spectrum of ingredients. And at the same time, as you see that more mining is going to have an effect and so on um, people. And so uh, we want to look at that and we want to make sure that in this energy transition, nobody is left behind. But this, is, this is something that's going to, is the, one of the greatest change in human history and everyone should get their fair share. So I'll speak first about what Mineral X is, a technological innovation. Uh, that is needed to do that increase in supply. Now, a little bit of history. Uh, I've been here at Stanford for 25 years. I work with a total of 37 oil companies uh, in, the, uh, in the area of decision-making under uncertainty. And this is with my collaborator, Tapan Mukherjee, who is also here in the room today. Four years ago, I met Kurt uh, in front of a poster and uh, you know, got together, and uh, this was when COBOL had 10 people. And so now we are way, way in the future. It's been an amazing journey. It's one of the, the, the biggest things I've done in my career, and, and now comes the second biggest thing I'm going to do in my career. So next comes Mineral X, and Mineral X is a group of people, and there's various students here on your heights and side, and they have posters around, so check that out. And we also an industrial affiliates program, just like the Stanford Center for Earth Resources Forecasting is an industrial affiliates program. So there are two inaugural members, and I'd like to 
acknowledge them uh, first, and I'm going to embarrass them. I'm going to call Kurt to the stage now, and I have we have made you a little gift as well as for Amar. So oh, we have something which is called the Charter <laughs> Member <laughs> Mineral X Affiliate T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Kurt loves swag, so if you can get up the front here, maybe somebody can take a, come take a picture uh, of us. Yeah, there we are. So you all heard about Kurt. All right, we also have our first uh, regular member uh, uh, that will soon all get settled out, and that is... Uh, Rio Tinto, uh, one of the largest mining companies, of course, on the planet. And Kendall will speak uh, tomorrow uh, and will talk a lot about uh, Rio's view on this energy transition as well as uh, mining. Okay, we have heard some sobering facts, and I will start with those. Uh, number one, we know that the U.S. is not ready to secure its own critical mineral supply that, as you've seen, the efficiency of that has been declining. And therefore, a resilient and decarbonized just mineral supply chain from exploration to recycling is possible but remains uncertain. So then we can ask ourselves what technology innovations are really needed. And we've, I made this slide before I knew about Drew's talk. So I put on two plans. Uh, one is master, uh, the master plan of Tesla that you heard before, but the other one is also a professor here at Stanford, Mark Jacobson, who just came out with this book here that says, no real miracles are needed. We have the technology that is there. Right? So what is now really needed? Well, we're going to have to make very intelligent decisions around how to scale things, how to build things, how to accelerate things, where to resource the material, how to make it all more efficient, and how to do the investments to do so. So who is going to make those intelligent decisions? We hear a lot about AI, and so one of our goals in Mineral X is to develop artificial intelligence to make complex decisions over long time horizons. Right? Because this is not a problem of just this year or next year. This is a problem of the next 25 years. So we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. And also in the next session, uh, my colleague Michael Kochendorfer will talk more about that. But we also have to think a little bit about what is artificial intelligence, because there are actually many fields of artificial intelligence. When you hear talk about today in the media about artificial intelligence, it's called generative, generate. The kind of artificial intelligence that we're going to talk about is the intelligent agent technology that can reason, act, and adapt better than humans. So what has Mineral X already pioneered? We, we're not starting from zero. Obviously, we started from 25 years of background. We have really focused uh, with the industry, uh, the resources industry, whether this is water uh, or oil and gas or geothermal into rapid scalable decision making. And fundamental to that is base, and I will talk about that. We've also pioneered, and we'll talk about that, is how you make complex decisions over a long time horizon using intelligent agents. We have applied that to uh, carbon sequestration. We have applied, this is all in real examples, we have applied that to mineral exploration. We're now applying that to put Vienna on geothermal energy. We've also pioneered data science and decision science education. We are, after all, an academic institute, uh, and we want to decimate uh, the, the uh, information that we produce. So let's talk a little bit more about Bayes. What is Bayes, and why Bayes? And people say, who's this guy? Uh, well, this was a reverend we're, we're living in the 18th century, and we'll talk about what he was thinking about. But if you want to have some good reads, uh, I recommend these reads. Uh, this is uh, Tversky and Kahneman, where two uh, 
economist that won the Nobel Prize for that paper here on the left, discovering that humans are not good at making judgment under uncertainty. In fact, they discovered that humans are unbeigean. So when we reason about uncertainty, we tend to bring in all kind of information that has actually nothing to bear about the question we're trying to answer. Right? And so they, they corrected, a, created an economic theory that corrected for this human biasness. So humans are not good at uncertainty, and certainly not good at uncertainty over a very long time horizon. So to illustrate that, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is not a trick professor question, uh, but this, is simp this question that I'm going to show looks trivial but has changed the history of science. So here we have two MLB baseball players and you, one has been batting and for those who don't know much about baseball, you have to hit the ball with the bat. <laughs> that's about it. So if you hit, then you get a hit and that's called a batting average of four out of 10 here for this left player, and for the right player, it's 300 out of 1,000. So you have to decide, it's a decision, whom to bet on to hit the ball next. This is pretty much all of investment, right? If you have, you have to decide as an investor what company to bet on that's gonna hit it out of the park. Well, Cobalt was such company, right? So this is that kind of question. The problem with this question is we have imperfect knowledge, right? Because we don't know P, the probability of hitting. So the answer to this question, the Bayesian answer is the right player and the frequentist answer is the left player, right? Because the frequentist answer is just saying, well, P is 0 0.4 and there's 0 0.33. Why is the Bayesian answer different from the, from you, from the intu intuitive answer? Well, the, to think about that, you have to understand that Bayes, its philosophy contains two elements. First element is, what do we know right now about baseball and baseball players? Right? We know that the score of 0 0.4 and 0 0.3 is much better than average. Right? The average for baseball and MLB is 2.2. That's the first information. That's information that doesn't come, it's not in the data. That's information of what we call prior knowledge. Then secondly, there is the second part is evidence. Evidence changes uncertainty. That's the Bayesian view on this problem. That's not the frequentist view on this problem. It's also clear that in the right-hand side, you have more evidence. And so Bayes is a simple calculation that combines these two elements and comes up with an answer, and that answer says you have to bet on the right player. Okay, I can go through the math, but that's not the point here. The point is that Bayes has won. I don't teach frequentists anymore. I used to do that 25 years ago. I said there's two philosophies. I don't teach that anymore. It says the one is just gone. Bayes has won. And Bayes has also become much more than just a rule. It has become a philosophy of science. It's awful that the rule was discovered 250 years ago. The philosophy has only been around 50 years. So that also means that only the Bayesian approach allows you for a consistent decision making. And the other approaches just don't. There is, however, a second element. And that has to do with the fact that Bayesian way of deciding is also an inductive way of deciding. And there's this other person here, Karl Popper, who made also an enormous contribution to science in saying that we can't really prove anything that involves uncertainty. We can only disprove something. We can also falsify. And so the Popper-Bayes approach is to say and this is now comes to what Kurt has been talking about, is what explains this decline partially? 
right? The easy stuff is discovered, and so what happens is you have a very high false positive rate in mineral discovery, and so this high false positive rate is due to the fact that a lot of stuff looks like an ore body. So if you're going to drill or you're going to acquire data that tries to confirm something, you're going to hit an extremely high false positive rate. That is just a simple consequence of the Bayesian philosophy and Bayes rule. Right. So the better way to do that is to think more about falsifying evidence. Evidence that can disprove hypothesis rather than try to confirm hypothesis. And this is fundamental to our work with cobalt and has been fundamental to my work when dealing with earth resources in general, is to think hard about what combination of evidence should you acquire, confirming or falsifying evidence. And that resulted in the paper that Kurt talk, uh, uh, talk showed. This idea of efficacy information is a Bayesian, proper Bayesian type of idea. It's to figure out where in the subsurface here, and this is an actual drill hole, uh, you need to hit the red zone, right? This is not a geophysical inversion. That is where should you be going in the subsurface such that you reduce uncertainty on what you'd like to know maximally before acquiring the information. So it is possible to not wait for the information. It is possible to predict effect of information. And these are real boreholes, real things. The paper came out after the borehole was drilled. That just shows you the irrelevance of academia <laughs> and papers. because the reviewers had all kinds of things to say that the English wasn't good and whatnot, right? Anyway, moving on to more than one decision. So more than one decision, complex decision making over long time horizons. If humans are truly unbeijian and are very difficult to make just one decision in a consistent and regular fashion, what about complex decisions? We're completely hopeless. This is when Mineral X started. It was when Cobalt announced that they had a deal to start developing a resource, a uh, copper resource in Zambia. We'll talk a lot about Zambia this afternoon. Uh, I started to realize that, OK, the stuff they are using, and I read this thing in the Wall Street Journal, that they, are, can, they got the deal because they used it AI, and they can do it faster. I'm thinking, OK, some of that stuff we are developing here together is having making some sense. So why not start to really upscale that? And this, then, is that drill hole. I'm sorry to steal your show, but this is <laughs> your Zambian uh, drilling. And that drilling is, in fact, supported by what is called Intelligent Prospector. It is an AI, an intelligent agent, that can make decisions of sequences in time of where to acquire data or what to do in a sequence such that you receive a certain goal. And so later on, John Mern, uh, who was a Stanford student uh, and uh, now works for COBA, will talk a lot about that specific technology. But I can already show you a little bit of what that means. Now, here we created a mock-up case because I can show real cases uh, that shows here somewhere in the in the copper belt typical drilling today. Right? You see a lot of the uh, the whole these dots that are all drill holes. A lot of them. All of these take time. They take money. Right? Not only money, but also time. So what is Intelligent Prospector? Intelligent Prospector is a software that, this, that tells you, it's a bit like a chess playing software, right? When you play chess, you don't drill one move, you don't play one move at a time, you make a sequence of moves. And your next move is dependent on what your future move can be, and is dependent on what future information will be available to you in order to make your current decision. That is the intelligent agent. We don't think like that. We're like one move at a time. We are optimizers, uh, closed loop optimizers. So on the right-hand side, you see 
let's say over that blue area, the current uncertainty on the quantity of, of interest. It's huge, right? And that's the problem because the red line is where the economic cutoff lies. So you want to be certain to be either above or below. If you're below, you, you walk away. If you're above, you move ahead. I mean, this is not a real case again. This is not that particular case. It's a markup. So intelligent prospector is a technique that's going to do it differently. And I'm showing here the movie. As you see, it doesn't drill on a grid, right? It's going to drill in what looks like a random pattern. But it is not a random pattern. It is an extremely informed pattern. The pattern is informed by the data that's available, by the key geological hypotheses that are available, and by anything of future information. On the right-hand side, you see the evolution of the uncertainties. Right? And you see it dances around the economic line. And at some point, and this is not a real case, it lands on one particular part of the line. And that's when you have decision with significant de-risk. Right? So to do that, you have to really think about the sequence of drilling and not do it one at a time. And this is the great saving and the great contribution. So that idea, and Michael Kochendorfer uh, will talk about that uh, in his talk after the break, uh, is formulated. It is a formulation that's called partially observable mark of decision processes. It's a mouthful. But it's a formulation of the problem Right? Because in AI, we also not want to just have algorithms. We want to formulate the problem in a proper mathematical fashion. And that formulation, as you will see, has four main components. You have to worry about uncertainty. You have to worry about observations that will reduce uncertainty. You have to worry about reward. What is it eventually you want to achieve? And those rewards can be conflicting. And then you have what actions in the real world do you have available? And that has to be done in time, possibly either sequences of drill holes or other kind of applications. So intelligent agents, therefore, are planners. Planners that account for present and future uncertainty. So what other applications are there, right? Because we're not stuck here with mineral exploration. Well, I'd say. That all long time horizon energy transition planning are these kind of plans. We're going to have to make plans, and those plans are subject to uncertainty. As you saw earlier, well, or Morgan said, none of those are coming out as to be the case. Well, that's maybe because our uncertainties are incorrect, and that we tend to be over optimistic. So we're now coming to the portion of the talk. We're going to talk a little bit more about what are we going to do next that is new. So we're, of course, we're going to continue a lot into this mineral exploration, uh, geosciences, and, and et cetera. But you know, we want to move forward. And so we have a proposal here uh, that is on the table, that is on, on the board, that talks about designing, intelligently designing critical mineral supply chains. Right? If this is indeed a long-term ha plan hor uh, horizon, how can you achieve that? So we got together with CSIRO Australia, just actually a month or so ago, right, uh, Megan? And we came up with a huge proposal around how can we design this, this problem, right? So who is going to be the intelligent designer? So what if there would be an AI that can start designing for humans a mineral supply chain? And we, put, we took lithium, right? Because lithium is interesting in the sense that lots of lithium comes out of Australia, uh, comes out of South America, even the US has some lithium resources. But it's not just about, as you saw with Drew, it's not just about mineral exploration. It's also about mining. Then it's about processing the minerals. Then it's about manufacturing and getting those into batteries and then recycling. So what is the question is, we're going to have to do this, all of this, but what is the expected time horizon at which all of these components are going to happen? 
And we'd like to do that very specifically because on the right-hand side, you see our actions in the real world. We can start salt and sea extraction, right? Now, that's one of the things we can start doing. Uh, and then we have the designer will be the intelligent agent, which will then design, as you see on the right-hand side, what is the optimal way of doing this, given the reward at the end. And the reward, of course, contains now multiple elements. We want decarbonized metals. We want secure, resilient ESG. We want all these particular rewards, right? So this is our grand proposal. And to talk a little bit more about that, I'm going to call uh, Megan Crocker, uh, who is Director um, of Strategic Partnership here at, at CSI Aurora US, and she talks a little bit more about uh, our proposal. But before doing that, I have more to embarrass. <laughs> so we also have hero t-shirts. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love so, it. <laughs> so we've, we've had a couple of great interactions over, over the last couple of months, and so Megan is oh, one of you. our heroes. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Megan. Oh, great. Okay. Well, uh, it is an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, just by raise of hands, uh, does everyone in the audience know CSIRO? Everyone? Oh, wow, I love the mining crew. The miners know Australia. Um, so I don't have to go into too much detail about what CSIRO does. Um, we, we do research across the whole spectrum from mining to manufacturing, energy, earth observation, all of which has implications here. Um, I'm obviously not Australian. I'm based out of the US office. We have a US presence based in San Francisco. And I, I also love this theme of technology not being the end solution because our strategy and our focus in the US and really our expertise is bridging collaborations. We want to take big and bold and creative action to solve these problems because it is absolutely our fundamental view that we can't do this alone. No one organization, no one company is going to solve some of these problems we're trying to address. It has to be collaborative. Um, and so this is why we are super excited to be working with Stanford because in our view, we're bringing, bringing together the absolute best in class in data science with deep, deep mining expertise of Australia. So just, just a couple points on that. Um, critical minerals in Australia are considered a national endowment, which means that we actually have to treat these resources to benefit the people. Um, Depending on commodity prices, about 15% of Australia's GDP is from the mining sector. And, and then within CSIRO, we have deep expertise in uh, sustainable mining practices, in social license to operate modeling. Um, we have uh, you know, a whole breadth of mining expertise that we can bring to the table here. Um, uh, I think t one other key point is about timing. So some of you may have seen the US-Australia Compact Framework that was signed in May. So this is a collaborative effort between Australia and the United States around clean energy and specifically critical minerals. So Biden intends to go to Congress, and this, it's expected this will happen before year end, to go to Congress to actually ask the US to treat Australia as a domestic source of minerals. This has huge, huge implications that we don't yet understand, um, but this is why we want to move quickly on this proposal. And so what we would absolutely invite corporates or uh, industrial partners to the table here, please come find me. would love to have a deeper conversation to share more information about how this partnership came about, what we could do, and how we can solve some problems specifically around lithium or, or beyond. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. All right, so, it, so as I say, Manuel X is not just about technical innovation. Uh, and as you see, technology, of course, is not a solution to everything. Uh, and uh, one really important component, and this is completely new to me, is to really start building community around that uh, and stewardship for all to represent equally. And you have been in contact probably with one of the amazing team members that we have. Uh, and I can't m imagine a better person to work with today, uh, and certainly not on the, uh, certainly on the problem of community building, and that is David 
Yin, and he will talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so first of all, I'd like to invite all the audience to join me. Um, so raise your hand. You can also stand up because you've been seated for one hour and 30 minutes. Um, so raise your hand or stand up. You think community building and supporting community is important for mineral development. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please sit down. Thank you so much. So you also stretch yourself. Uh, 60% of the global critical mineral discoveries are on the indigenous land. So without building community, without supporting community, without respecting, without environmental justice, all your investment will fail. And the energy transition will eventually won't have enough materials. So we have to build a community. The question is how to. So today, we all sit in one room. We have 205 people in this room, from investors, miners, end users, scholars and students, policymakers, local representatives, and also NGOs, activists. And we, this room is actually the most unique room with the most diverse and unique stakeholders in the mining sector. And we are making actually the biggest com mining community, the biggest mining community in the Silicon Valley. And see, it's actually easy to start building a community. Um, the question is how to continue this building. So I'd like to share a couple of examples that we are doing at Mineral X, and I look forward to hear your feedback. And more important, I look forward to your particip participation on this um, mineral um, community engagement. So we work closely with um, Stanford Environmental Justice Group a working group to embed the environmental justice into our research and, edu and teaching activities. And by supported by Beijing Bama, and we are building a major initiative with UM6P, um, Mohammed VI Polytechnic University based in Morocco, a major education initiative to support education in Africa and beyond. So, and in terms of specific projects, um, I think Sophia is sitting, in the back, is sitting standing in the back, and she's traveling this summer to the north of Arctic Circle to study how, how the exploration companies can engage and involve in the health relationship with the local community in Arctic. And Jonas, who's sitting there, uh, is joining us as our HAI fellow, and he's starting how to develop a AI tool to support the decision makers for responsible mining activities in the rainforest. The, one of the great benefits of having a community is that you can promote education. Speaking of education, um, last week there was a report in the United States. Um, there are about 600 enrolled undergraduates for the mining. Um, so what does that number mean? By contrast, in China, my country, um, and we have 70,000 undergraduates enrolled in mining. So the mining sector, I mean, the energy transition is going to run out the future talents, run out of the, the labor force. So that's a major issue that we should, and not speaking about the incoming retirement wave, um, that's going to be another huge problem. And so we have to encourage the young generation to, to join this sector, this tradi traditional sector. And to do that, we have to transform this traditional sector by making it more diverse, more inclusive, and also by speaking their language and also build a platform that they can build a community for themselves. Um, we, uh, at Mineral X, we have we strive actually to, um, to scale up this kind of education. Um, so over the past uh, decades, we published a couple of uh, several textbooks, mainly in predicting resources, uh, decision making, and uncertainty quantification. Uh, this year, we have a, actually a major um, textbook that's incoming uh, in August, Designs for Geoscience, which is actually the first design textbook for 
um, uh, for critical minerals. Uh, we have a lot of quite innovation in this textbook. We are providing a series of accessible videos on a public platform where the students can learn themselves um, uh, by reading the videos and looking back to the textbooks. We provide uh, tutorials and open sources book that they can play with. They can make nice maps uh, and nice plots. And also we include a lot of world class cases for critical mineral exploration from Quebec to California, uh, from Greenland to Antarctica, and from Antarctica to Europe and to Asia. Um, so all those, the effort and the mission is to make critical learning on critical minerals is cool and is also fun to learn. So, um, so this effort, we are building the future talents for the industry. But actually, the industry is already have a big problem. Kurt has shown that very contrast figure where the R&D in the mining sector is pretty scary, is pretty um, worrying. And, uh, and speaking of, I know a lot of major mining companies don't even have a proper um, R&D department, uh, which I uh, don't want to mention names. But, um, but this is. Uh, this is pretty, I mean, you can, if you want to achieve the goal by 2035, by 2050, if you don't have a proper technology developed, uh, it's, um, that's the problem. So we would love to, we'd love to invite you to join us and to, you know, share your problem with us. And we, we would like to help you to, um, to, to build the, uh, the technology, to, to look into the prototypes, because we have 25 years knowledge of transferring research to the industry applications, and you have seen a couple of examples already. Um, with that, I'd love to pass the last slides to Jeff to uh, conclude the talk. Thank you. All right, I'm, I guess I'm just going to stand here, and, and, uh, and uh, this is the end of the presentation. So uh, stand here and then see if you have any questions where the microphones are on, on, on the side. Um, if you have any questions, otherwise we just uh, go for the coffee. Seems like coffee sounds good, right? All right, <laughs> let's do that and let's uh, come back in, uh, in 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>